Please welcome to the stage the 24th and 25th U.S. Secretaries of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar and Javier Becerra, in conversation with Institute Chairman Michael Milken to discuss the road ahead, reflections and insights to improve health for all. Mr. Secretaries, thank you for joining us today. And I just want to stress to everyone watching this or in with us today how important your jobs are. Taking care of the health of not only people in the United States, but in many ways the world. And I thought I might start by going back to a 1754 Benjamin Franklin's slide, which told the colonies that they needed to combine in order to survive. So he took this snake and divided it into parts as a message to try to convince the heads of the 13 colonies they needed to be one. And the same thing exists today when we think of a system of health care whether it's the hundreds of philanthropists in the medical field that have joined us, the academic centers, not only from the United States, but around the world, have joined us today, the government agencies, for-profit biotech, bioscience companies today. And I just want to set the stage for the enormous responsibility these two public servants have taken on over the years here to remind everyone that the number one factor on economic growth in the United States and the world in the last 200 years is public health and medical research. And if we think about what's occurred, most of the economic growth of, and size of our population has grown over the last 200 years, at the start of the 20th century, average life expectancy on the planet was 31 years of age. Today, it is over 70. And so we're going to touch on the issues of life expectancy, inclusion, equitable access to health, and many other issues. But one of the things with the very diverse group of more than a 1,000 people that are with today. I thought I'd start, Mr. Secretaries, with the first question. How does HHS collaborate and engage internally with other agencies as well as externally with the states, local government, and communities to accomplish the mission of the agency? And I think. Many people who are viewing are aware that this is the largest sector of the United States government, more than one-third of the government's budget, maybe twice as large as our defense budget, is focused on public health and medical research. So let's start with the 24th secretary uh, of HHS. How did you see coordinating between these diverse efforts here? Well, Mike, thank you. And I, I think your point about the, the, the broken snake slide that Ben Franklin used, I guess he didn't have PowerPoint. It was probably not a slide. Uh, but that. Well, that, that, <laughs> that was his picture. Exactly. Um, that uh, I think it's an apt description of our healthcare system because, in a way, calling it a system is an overstatement. Um, it's a disaggregated collection of different pieces working sometimes in harmony, sometimes at odds. And I do think that our roles as health secretary allow you to serve as a convener. I'll give one example of that type of collaboration that for Operation Warp Speed. Really, I thought of it as three key collaborations or partnerships. Uh, one was a partnership within the U.S. government because Warp Speed could not have happened without the intense partnership of the Defense Department. And, uh, and then, of course, many other agencies, the Department of Energy with its, you know, with its uh, quantum computing powers, uh, and many other agencies involved. Then there's collaboration and cooperation with the private sector. 
Um, it's not a government solution. Uh, putting a man on the moon was not a government solution. Building the atomic weapon of the Manhattan, Pro Manhattan Project was not a government solution. Each of these were great public-private collaborations with mutual respect, understanding each other's needs and incentive structures. And then the final was collaboration and partnership with states because we don't have a national level, federal level system. We act with and through states and even some certain cities have their own independent public health departments that as secretary we interact with. So pulling all of those together, and I could probably go through 20 other types of collaborations, but it really is almost a, the center of a bicycle hub and spoke kind of model. So Secretary Rivera, you come from California. You represented California. Uh, now you're representing, in many ways, not just the United States, but the world. How have you seen this issue of collaboration, not only in the US, but maybe internationally today? Mike, first, uh, thanks to you, to Diana Dunn, and the team that made it possible for both Secretary Azar and I to be here. I appreciate it. Um, in, in many ways, that, that diagram that you see of the uh, cut up snake still applies. Uh, I think Secretary Azar was right, you know, spot on, right on the money when he mentioned how we're still a system, I, I call it a nationwide system of public health, not a national system, because we're dependent on the 50 states to want to buy in because the Constitution gave them control over health care. And so we have to prod the states to do certain things. So that's why you think Medicare, Medicaid, all of them happen because we put money on the table for the states to buy in. They didn't have to provide health care to seniors or to low income, but they do it because they get a big portion of money from the feds to do so. And so we have to, we see that continuing. So today, uh, partnerships, well, we just commercialized now on vaccines for uh, COVID. Before, under Secretary Azar's leadership at first, and then with our continuation, the federal government provided access to vaccines to all Americans for COVID. It's nearly 700 million shots in the arms of Americans to date. Now that's transitioning. Now the manufacturers of those vaccines are gonna take over, and it's now back to the commercial market. At the same time, we're relying on the states to continue to feed us information, data, that lets us know where the hotspots are with COVID. They're not required to do that. During COVID and the crisis, the national emergency, they did have to because we had powers, national emergency powers, to require them to give it to us. Once the public health emergency came down, we lost that emergency power to demand that they give us data. Now we have to get them to voluntarily provide us the data of what's going on in their states. And I should just mention quickly, Mike, internationally, we're in the, the midst of trying to reach a global pandemic deal that would let us be collectively prepared and, and collectively respond to any future uh, pandemic or other form of attack that might come our way. You know, it's gonna be as tough to get a global deal as it, you can imagine it is to get a national deal on what to do on healthcare. And like I, I, you know, I, sh I should mention, you, you hinted at this, that Secretary Becerra commented, which is the global aspect. That's another partnership that is very important. Um, 2020 just coincidentally happened to be America being the presidency of the G7. And so every, almost every Thursday morning at 8 a.m., I would convene the health ministers across the G7, and we would share lessons learned, we'd share best practices, what we were seeing on COVID on a weekly or bi-weekly basis and really helped that type of collaboration and coordination. Yep. So you just, uh, Secretary Vivera, you just came, Becerra, you just came back from meeting. Talk about that internationalization cooperation. So as Secretary Hazar mentioned, we get together, whether through G7 or G20 or the World Health Assembly, and for the last more than a year, there's been a concerted effort to try to not just come up with an accord, but also to update our international regulations that deal with health. And it's not an easy deal uh, because everyone has their particular angle to this. And what we're trying to do is have a, an approach that ultimately has everyone taking certain responsibilities. You can imagine trying to get the U.S. to sign on to some form of treaty where we're committed to do something in particular. When was the last time you heard the Senate pass a treaty? And so we're trying to convince our international partners that if, we, if they try to go through, down there, uh, the road of saying, 
binding agreements that are essentially a treaty, we may never get to the point of getting 67 votes to pass that out of the Senate. And we want in, we want to do stuff. We, in fact, we did more than any other country did during COVID, but we have to make it so it's realistic. And so we're trying to get there. We ho we're hoping that May of next year, we actually strike this deal. So it's interesting. I think everyone here and around the world would like to know what is the path to take to become the secretary of HHS? <laughs> okay, what, what, how, what prepares you to be a diplomat deal with science, et cetera. And I'm not sure everyone's aware um, that that path included Yale Law School or Stanford Law School. So you're probably not aware that one of the necessary requirements to lead the health efforts for the world is to go to law school. Yeah. Now, <laughs> Alex, let's start with you. When did you start thinking about public health, medical research, et cetera, for the first time. So oddly, my first ever job was as an intern in the Reagan administration when I was in college. I just ended up being an intern, and he'll under, the Secretary Becerra will understand what a dirty word this is. I was an intern in the Health and Income Maintenance Division of the Office of Management and Budget. <laughs> which is the group that supervises the money at HHS, of all things. Um, I then went, that actually, I did a lot of legal work there, ended up going to law school from that, but then forgot about healthcare until just really by accident in the Bush-Cheney transition in 2001, I got a call from Secretary Tommy Thompson's office asking me if I had any interest in being the general counsel of HHS. And, you know, I'll just let you in a little secret. We conservative lawyers, we don't dream of, being involved in the welfare state normally. Um, you know, it's separation of powers, war powers, that's what you're, you're sort of raised on. Um, it's idiotic, once I got there, I'm like, wow, one-seventh of the American economy, one-third of the U.S. government, my goodness, um, and it became my life's work, but that really was what started me on that journey was in many respects fate slash serendipity. So I remember after 9-11 um, visiting HHS and Secretary Thompson, had created his own war room yeah. there at HHS and to focus on the health of people throughout the world. Xavier, what was your path? So uh, I, I married into health. Um, my sweetheart in college, who then went on to medical school, uh, became a high-risk uh, OBGYN, a perinatologist. And so I was surrounded by that all the time. but. When I came to Congress, uh, I had the privilege of representing a district in Los Angeles that at the time was probably the third or fourth, fourth most uninsured congressional district in the nation. But uh, you have to juxtapose that because while we had one of the highest rates of uninsurance for healthcare, we had, I think my congressional district had the highest rate of work participation, which is a, depart a, a term that Department of Labor uses to show how often or how much you work. So on average, the people in my district work longer hours, more days than any other place in the nation, yet they didn't earn enough and therefore couldn't afford to get health insurance. So it became a big issue for me. Uh, my service in Congress included a lot of work on health care issues, including on the Ways and Means Committee. And over time, I just did always did a, a lot of work in health care. But you're right. Uh, we don't have necessarily the, the right three last three letters behind our name. And I got, that was one of the biggest criticisms I got during my confirmation process is that I didn't have the MD, I had the JD behind my name. But, but you know, th that, that comes up a lot. And in, in many countries, being health secretary, health minister are doctors. But when you think about the largest part of the HHS budget, you're actually running the world's largest insurance companies, yeah. the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, that, and, and that's business leadership. The law for, can be very good training for that in terms of rigorous logical thinking. Um, and a lot of the department is not actually MD focused. Yeah, you're managing. Yep. So one of the other challenges that you're both very aware is balancing the public need for health care and the cost of health care. And so the Inflationary Reduction Act, the Medicare drug price negotiation program is in full implementation. What milestones have been achieved, Xavier, and the positive effect, and 
how do you balance the needs of pharmaceutical companies and industries being able to innovate and patients being able to afford life-saving and life-giving medications? So, uh, by the way, Mike, uh, my parents had the wisdom of naming me Javier Becerra with an X, and I know in life I've had to go throughout most of my life explain the X is pronounced like an H, Javier. Um, but when you got Xavier University and Xavier Cougat, and you, you're going to have a tough time. But anyway, uh, to the question, um, as I said, I learned a long time ago to try to do what we could to reduce costs. More, not only because uh, in my family we didn't have a lot of money, so we had to always make ends meet. But um, my mom would always, I always tell folks this, my mom would always just really pound in us. Mejor prevenir que remediar. Better to prevent than to remediate. And in healthcare, it's absolutely the case that it is better to prevent than try to remediate. Unfortunately, we have a system of healthcare that is focused on curing, on treating disease, on getting you to get well again, rather than trying to promote your wellness from the very beginning. And so what we're trying to do is get to the point of wellness before treating illness. Part of that, of course, means making sure you have access to the right medicines, but if it becomes too expensive, it becomes very difficult. So the Inflation Reduction Act, as, as a principal component, the reduction of costs for Americans on their prescription medication. Everyone knows about the ins insulin today. Months of insulin now, uh, those on Medicare won't pay more than 35 bucks. Less than a year ago, they were paying $150, $200. Today, those same seniors on Medicare can get a, sh a shingles vaccine. And I, suspect, I see some folks here are the age to get a shingles vaccine. If you haven't, go get it. You do not want shingles. Um, that could cost you three, four hundred bucks. Today, zero cost. And so president was very committed when he ran for office. He, for president, he said, on health care, I'm going to lower costs with better care for more people. And, and so far, that's what we're, we're doing. We're going to continue. And on negotiating drug prices, it, and it's hard to believe that you have to explain to folks why it's a good idea to be able to negotiate to get the best price. We, we're accustomed to doing that, whether it's buying your car or going to the flea market. Uh, and uh, I've never heard that trying to inspire competition is bad for America. Our system is based on competition. You know, uh, competition, negotiating prices, that's as American as apple pie. And so that's what we're trying to do. For the 65 million people on Medicare who need medicine more than other folks, why shouldn't we get to negotiate the best price for them? instead of have a fixed price fixed by the industry, and that's why we're negotiating. And we're gonna make sure that we continue to innovate in America by making sure we have competition drive what the price of prescription drugs will be. Alex, as you know, uh, the United States <clears throat> and COVID, et cetera, in many ways protects the world with innovation. Our pharmaceutical companies, our biotech companies today, and. I know you have had to think through how to balance the issues of affordable health care uh, today and, and still providing incentives to the private place industry. What, what, how do you view that? So my approach in health care, and maybe it comes from having been in industry and being a microeconomist and thinking is, how do we get in healthcare market forces to work as best possible? Because you're going to get the right allocation of capital, the right incentive structures on innovation, the more you've got basically free market approaches towards pricing mechanisms. There are ways in which, of course, that doesn't work well. In Part B, that's the physician-administered drugs in the United States, we historically simply pay uh, a sticker price, price plus a markup, 106% of average sales price. So what I did was actually mandate that if the drug companies were willing to negotiate deals with socialist countries abroad that are high income, there'd be most favored nation status and we would get the benefit of that deal in part B. Now, in fact, that wouldn't pull us down to their level. What it would do would be to create a market regulating mechanism where they wouldn't be willing to give away the store to the Europeans because they'd have to pay the penalty here in the US of that trade-off and it would lead to basically a trade measure and equalization. What's happening in part D really concerns me. Um, I mean. With all respect, I, I'm a, so you didn't mention I'm a lawyer, but I'm a Scalia clerk. And uh, Justice Scalia, we used the Webster's second edition, which is the normative definition of words, how they should be used, 
Webster's third is a heresy. It's a positive of how words are actually used. Um, I looked up this morning, second edition. To negotiate means to treat with another respecting purchase and sale, to confer with another in bargaining or trade, to hold conference and discussion with a view to reaching agreement on a contract. The Inflation Reduction Act's negotiation provisions are not that. It's, price, it's just price fixing. It's saying if you wish to be a company, not just a product, a company selling in Medicare and Medicaid, which is the bulk of the market in the United States, you must accept a price set by Secretary Becerra or, or his successors um, according to certain factors, including a statutory regime. Um, that's just price fixing, and the sanction is a 1,900% penalty if you don't comply, or being kicked completely your entire company out of the program. Even the socialist countries of Europe, um, it's just product by product you can decide whether you will take the price they're willing to give you. Um, there's a lot that actually in the IRA that I worked with Senators Wyden and Grassley on. So the inflation penalties, uh, the restructuring of the Part D benefit, the catastrophic coverage there. So there are things that are very targeted towards reducing costs for people, but I'm quite nervous, Mike, with the IRA that we're gonna see a dramatic reduction in the incentives to innovation. You won't see investment in line extensions. You won't have enough time to add new indications. You might see delayed launches in the US while you launch in other countries. I mean, Americans aren't gonna be happy when France gets drugs before we do. Um, you're gonna have the perverse incentive where, let's say Embril, which let's, let's say it's paying a 60% rebate right now to the PBMs. It gets put on the IRA as a price-fixed drug, that rebate now no longer goes to the Part D plan, and so the Part D plan has to cover the drug, but it can put it as tier six. So it could make it a bottom tier drug with 80% cost sharing and cover a more expensive novel IL-23 mechanism in tier two, lower price. And so you could perversely end up having more out-of-pocket costs to the patient from this system because it's not built with an understanding of how Part D plans work. So I want to stress, and I'm, I'm going to go back to Secretary Becerra, how important this issue is. And you raised a really important issue. And many years ago uh, in California, Governor Brown created this commission that I was on called the Commission for Personalized Medicine. And after nine months, we changed our name to the Commission for Precision Medicine because of sequencing. We now could give you precisely what you needed. And before we submitted the report, in line with your comments, um, Secretary Becerra, we changed our name to Precision Health. Why are we spending 80, 90 percent of the cost of health care on care and not focused? on permission, but I think you have a little different view of this challenge. And, and I just want to stress to everyone here in the room, this is an important balancing act. It is these vaccines, et cetera, and cures of disease that really have driven the world, not only the extension of life, but the increased quality of life. And so, it's a difficult balance of what is best for the population and the access to care at affordable rates, and can we create incentives for people to invest billions of dollars? Secretary Becerra? Yeah, so I, you wouldn't be surprised that I have a slightly different interpretation of the... <laughs> we would be actually. disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think you have to go back to some fundamentals. First, uh, no one is captive in this negotiation. No one is forced to negotiate. If any of those drug makers don't wish to negotiate, they're not required to. They are asked to participate in, in the negotiation on their, a particular drug. If they want access to the 65 million Americans who have Medicare, we're saying, well, we want to be able to negotiate a price. It's like, it's, it's like you. No car dealership requires you to buy the car from them. Uh, so it's unfair to sort of claim that these companies are going to be compelled to accept a price that a, the secretary sets. No, you don't have to participate in that process. Secondly, 
in that process, we're going to essentially disclose to them all the information we're getting. In fact, we're asking them for information so we know exactly how they're coming about the pricing of their particular product. We'd like to have some transparency so we can see what they're doing. We'll show them as well. There are companies in these, as Alex put it, sort of socialized European uh, health systems. There are companies that are based in those countries that are producing these very pharmaceutical drugs. So it, it ain't so bad that they are willing to actually base themselves there and still be profitable. But more to the point, why is it that those manufacturers, and Alex sort of gave you a little bit of a hint of this, why is it that those same drugs that we're paying one amount for, those countries are able to secure those drugs at a third of the price that we are. Same drugs, same drugs. Why are we the folks who get taken on a ride to pay for those drugs? All we want to do is negotiate, sort of, to Alex's point pre previously, we just want to negotiate to make sure we're not, we're not the saps here and being taken advantage of so they can make money elsewhere or keep the price lower elsewhere. We want to have fairness for the 65 million Americans who are on Medicare. I'd love to have it for everyone. But right now, the law only gives us authority for the folks on Medicare. But at the end of the day, these are market forces. We can't negotiate a deal without being able to show folks what's behind the curtain. And remember, none of the drugs that we're going to uh, target for negotiation, the first 10, are drugs that have tremendous competition. These are all drugs that have to have the, the market and, and all the data show don't have real competition on their price. Otherwise, if there were competition, we can't include them for negotiation. And so, uh, you know, all, all the companies that are part of the negotiation sued us to not go forward with this new law. And all, so far, they've lost every one of those lawsuits. And guess what? All, all of those drug companies have signed up to negotiate with us as well. So we're not going to answer this question because the two secretaries could debate this for the next two <laughs> yes, weeks. We but I, we want to stress how important this is. And I just want to underline that bioscience and public health has driven the world for more than 200 years. And the vaccines that have been approved over this period of time, we just don't even remember. Now, let's go to one of the uh, great successes of medical research in a short period of time, and that was our efforts in COVID-19. I personally was flying back from our conference in Johannesburg and felt a dark cloud at the end of February circling the world as this COVID. And we, at the Milken Institute, at Faster Cures, at all of our centers, we pulled the leaders together and said that we would all be judged by what we did during this period of time. And one day of accelerating a solution might be worth 10,000 to 25,000 lives. Alex, you were there. You were involved. I was calling you constantly. So, and, and the teamwork required, what Barter did, et cetera. Take us back for just a couple moments to those days and the strategy. Yeah, so we were already early on investing in funding through BARDA, Project BioShield, NIH, in therapeutics and vaccines from, real, from really the first days we were funding them. But we were funding through the traditional grant-like mechanisms, which means you're putting money out there and the drug companies are working according to their own schedules. And what I realized by the end of March was that wasn't going to get us there in any relevant time frame that would save the lives that we needed to save. And so that's when I came up with working with, with, uh, with Peter Marks and Bob Cadlick and Paul Mango on our team with the framework for what became Operation Warp Speed. We actually, I initially called it uh, Manhattan Project 2. That was its code name originally. It was MP2. Certain people then suggested maybe that wasn't the best name for a project designed to save millions of lives. Um, and... Uh, so the idea, and this is where having been involved in and run part of a drug company and understand the incentives made a difference. I, what I said to the team was, take money off the table. I will get any amount of money that you need, whether we have it or I need to go to Congress to get it. Take money off the table. Be constrained only by the laws of science and physics, by what can actually be done. So we de-risked everything. We pre-funded and de-risked all development. We pre-funded and de-risked all manufacturing. We were in large-scale commercial manufacturing of vaccines in June of 2020 
when we were still beginning phase two studies of molecules. That's unprecedented. Um, De-risk the commercial market. Most of these companies had gotten out of making these drugs because Zika, MERS, monkeypox, they had done that work, but they got out because the market collapsed before they could actually get their products to market. So guarantee a market. So take all of that, fund it all, de-risk it, because drug companies, it's the riskiest business on earth that, that draws the most risk-averse people on earth to work in it. You, how do you de-risk their investments? By using the full power of the US government. And that's how we were able to drive OWS to be so fast. We had massive clinical trials, 30,000 people in each arm of these clinical trials for vaccines. Um, that led to faster results. We were pre-manufacturing at commercial scale, so we figured out how to optimize manufacturing. We had the full power of the Defense Department working there on manufacturing, on distribution, logistics, procurement, all of that. And that's what drove it. So we estimated that it was costing just the United States $1 trillion a month. And your decision that 10, 20, 30 billion was a drop in the bucket. And the idea that the US government and HHS leadership would manufacture product before we knew if it worked, so we didn't have to wait six months, that a pharmaceutical company would shut down its production to produce another pharmaceutical company's product on a six month, that you would build production facilities before you even knew if the product worked, was an amazing change. And we, led by Esther Kroff on Faster Cures, we focused as ground zero on, on every single more than 500 antivirals and vaccines so anyone in the world could see it was going on. But just because you have a solution or proved you had a solution, if we go back to the polio vaccine, more than a year after it was approved, less than 1% of all teenagers in America have been vaccinated. And it took a young man on the Ed Sullivan Show to get vaccinated named Elvis Presley to convince people if it was okay for Elvis, it was okay for us. And within six months, 80% of all teenagers in America have been vaccinated. Secretary Becerra, you came in recognizing all these challenges. And one million Monday morning quarterbacks telling us what we should have done, what we did do, was dropped on your doorstep. What are the lessons learned, and are we prepared for another pandemic? So we learned that uh, we don't have enough Elvises, and <laughs> we don't have the type of directed, concerted uh, uh, investment that you need, except when it becomes a crisis. And so what Secretary Azar described is how essentially, uniquely, the federal government was able to bring all of these talents and these scientific uh, capabilities together to give us something that otherwise would have taken a long time and probably would not have been distributed as equitably as it ultimately was. When we came in, and by the way, today, uh, uh, you see all of the COVID operations based at HHS. While they were at DOD, they have now, Operation Warp Speed is now HCORE. It is based at HHS and has been, you probably didn't recognize it, it has been since 2021. Uh, and we've managed it very, very well. As I mentioned earlier, some 700 million shots have gone into the arms of Americans with the COVID vaccine. By the way, if you haven't gotten vaccinated with the up-to-date vaccine, I urge you to do so. It has proven the most effective, keeping you uh, safe. And quite honestly, if you're going to go for the holidays and start kissing your grandma and everybody else, this is a good time to make sure that you don't infect that your 80, 90-year-old grandparents. Um, it took everyone coming together. It took what we usually don't have, the authorities we don't have, because as we described earlier, we're a nationwide system on public health, not a national system. And we ultimately end up waiting until we have a crisis before we 
hit, you know, the light bulb goes off and we realize we got to do this together. But again, only the federal government would have made this happen. And thank God that Secretary Azar and his team decided to make sure that nothing was an obstacle of getting us there because otherwise millions more would have died. So you talked about an emergency and one of the side effects of COVID has been a mental health emergency in, in our country. Uh, how does it look from HHS? In fact, as we all know, we've actually had a reduction of life expectancy in the United States over the past few years. So, Secretary Becerra, how do you, you attempt from HHS to coordinate the efforts, or what changes do you see in the mental health area today? So we've been facing a mental health crisis for quite some time. Uh, you, you poll Americans, nine and 10 will tell you America's facing a mental health crisis. Uh, COVID just exposed it, made it more obvious, made it so you could not ignore it. Uh, president Biden has made sure we've invested more than any previous president on mental health, but we're so far behind. We have a law that says you have to treat mental health on par with all other types of health, physical health. We still don't see providers, insurers doing that. And so we're trying to move in that direction. One of the things that we've done is at least try to make sure people can reach someone because too often what happens is, and the reason you've seen so many uh, suicides in the last few years is because people give up hope. And so we're trying to at least make sure they get connected. So you, I hope you've heard by now about 988. It is 911 for those who are going through a mental health crisis. And so you can dial today 988, actually text, you can chat today or call, and you'll, you'll get connected with someone who can start giving you some good advice on what to do. We're also expanding what are called uh, critical health care access points. Uh, for those with mental health services, 24-7 critical access care, that wasn't available before. But we, what we need to do is change this framework where too many insurers, too many providers don't treat mental health at par with what we consider regular physical health. You can go in and get your, your child's arm mended if, if he or she breaks it. You can go in for your cold. Uh, you can do all those things that we're so accustomed to, but Go to a, your primary care physician and, and ask her or him uh, what to do about mental health, and they'll probably say, I'm gonna have to refer you to a specialist because I, did, I didn't get trained in that. And that's one of the problems is we don't train to be able to preventatively start dealing with mental health, and we're trying to change that. I, I mean, I, I think mental health is gonna be the next wave of health reform. We're the last developed country that pays for substance use disorder and mental health care by basically grant and cash pay. As Secretary Becerra noted, I mean, mental health parity really is not a reality. Uh, we pay primary care doctors who really only treat the most mild instances of mental health disorder. Uh, we pay them more than we pay psychiatrists for the same, for, for the same amount of time uh, delivering care. Um, we have had some really positive movements. Congress passed the expansion of the certified behavioral health, community behavioral health centers, which could be a new way of delivering holistic behavioral and substance use disorder care to individuals. Um, but we have a long, long way to go here. So let me uh, deal with two other issues. The first one is the enormous demographic changes that have occurred in our country. And Secretary Massera, you full well known that anyone under 25 in California today, that more than 50% of everyone under 25 in California is now of Latin American ancestry, that our country has changed from a country where 85% of the people that weren't born here were born in Europe or Canada to today where 85% or so of the people not born here have come from Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, or Latin America. And so this has been a very important issue for our faster cures, but it's really the theme of this Future of Health Summit here in 2023 is essentially equitable health care from this standpoint. Let's start with you, Secretary Becerra. How do you see the opportunity for equitable health care? And we know it works 
one of our medical foundations, the Prostate Cancer Foundation, with the DOD, put up $50 million for a program here that if you served the country and you were in the VA system, had served the country in the DOD, now in the VA system, that if you entered a VA system, you would also enter the leading cancer center. And over a period of four to six years, we've been able to reduce the death rate of African Americans, which was 100% higher than the general population in prostate cancer, by offering equal care. I know this is the theme of this conference and our focus, and I know both you secretaries, this has been a key area that you've both been focused on. Secretary Becerra, why don't you start on this issue? So we start by incorporating equity. We call it equity by design. And so when we are going to propose a program or amend a regulation or propose new regs, uh, we insist that our teams consider equity in the design of whatever we're going to shoot out. That helps ensure that you're not leaving people behind. Quick example, when I came in in uh, 2021, March or so, by April or so, it became pretty obvious getting the, the daily briefings, uh, as Alex mentioned, he got as well on COVID, that what we were seeing, what we always see, the disparity grow. Uh, by M April, May of 2021, about two-thirds of white adult Americans had received at least their first shot of the COVID vaccine. Less than 50% of black and Latinos had at that point received their shot, and you could see the disparity growing. So we said, we're, we're not going to wait for folks to realize that the federal government is making the vaccine available to everyone for free. Too many people didn't know it. Too many people couldn't get off of work to go get it. So we're going to go where they are. So that's what we did. We told our teams, let's work with the states and let's go where people are that are being missed. By January of 2022, more than 90% of adult white Americans had received at least one shot of the COVID vaccine. 90%, at least 90% of black American adults had received at least one shot. 90% of Latino American adults had received at least a first shot. Asian American, Native American, every, everyone at least we'd reach 90% with everyone on that first shot. And that's because we didn't wait for them to come to us equity by design, we went to them, and that's what we continue to do. That's why we have a record number of Americans today who are insured. We have more than 300 million Americans who today have their own insurance coverage for healthcare. Never happened before in the country. Private or public insurance, they now have it. And uh, under President Biden, we have seen Obamacare go from about 11 million people who receive their insurance, health insurance, uh, through the, the Obamacare program to over 16 and a half million people. And that's because we didn't wait for folks to come to us. The greatest increases in Obamacare coverage, black and Latino Americans. It's not that they didn't want it, it's that they didn't know enough about it, but now that they know about it, they're signing up. So Alex, you were there and many communities, I know we went out to the African American churches particularly to talk about health, but Many of them are skeptical, were skeptical at the time. You were there in the middle of this pandemic. People were scared, different opinions. How do you see the closing of this health gap? There's no reason why your zip code should determine your lifespan or the quality of your life. Mike, you stole my line. I was gonna say the number one focus has to be how do we make sure your zip code doesn't determine the quality of health care that you get in this country. And I think a lot of that involves democratizing access to the highest quality care. We are entirely too slow. We've got to dramatically change the cycle times of high quality clinical practice adoption throughout the medical profession. Everybody, regardless of zip code, ought to be able to get the highest end oncology and cancer care. Um, we, need to, we need to be able to fix rural health care, maternal mortality, maternal health care. Um, we've got to get the practice of medicine throughout the country democratized, have equal access to people to be able to get into that care. It shouldn't matter where you live or what strings you pull, whether you live or die from cancer in this country. Um, and that, that so we have these pockets, and we just don't share the learning. We don't update our education. We don't, we don't share the best practices. We don't share the access to clinical trials. We need to democratize access to clinical trials, which, which we did remarkably well, I think historically well, on the COVID vaccines. The, but that was intentional. 
I mean, that was Jerome Adams, our Surgeon General, Francis Collins, Tony Fauci, um, and many others sitting there every Saturday morning, Monses Slowey, sitting there every Saturday morning with the drug companies saying, your results on clinical trial enrollment aren't acceptable, and the DSMB will not open up the results with the type of data that you are presenting so far. You've got to go outside of your usual primary investigators. You've got to go outside of your usual clinical trial subjects. You've got to go outside of your usual enrollment sites, and you've got to get people in. And with that intentionality and force, it actually worked. Well, one, Secretary Becerra, Secretary Azar, we thank you. We thank you for your commitment uh, to service. Um, Many of us in the world of philanthropy, I learned 50 years ago that no good deed ever goes unpunished uh, from that standpoint. And you've taken on, both of you, such enormous challenges that we had to face. And um, we just want to thank you for your commitment and for your continued work in this area. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.